Gaude amus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers. I'm Jim Papandrea, and this podcast is a production of Catholic Culture. Sign up for our newsletter at catholicculture.org slash newsletter. Today we continue our series on the heresies with Episode 10, Rebaptism and the Donatists. If you listened to the last episode, you know about the schism of Novation. And you know that Novation seems to have rebaptized people who came over to his faction, but who had been baptized in the Catholic mainstream after the persecution. Why did he do this? Because he was afraid that they might have been baptized by someone who had lapsed in the persecution, that is, made the pagan sacrifices out of fear. But in practicing rebaptism, Novation revealed that he was working with a flawed understanding of baptism. In fact, a flawed understanding of the sacraments in general. So, one of the results of the 3rd century persecution and the schism of Novation was a controversy over sacramental theology. The question is, does the validity, and therefore the effectiveness, of a sacrament depend on a certain level of holiness in the one who presides over the sacrament. Novation would say that if you got baptized and later found out that the bishop who baptized you had lapsed, well then you have not, in fact, been baptized. Now, to be clear, he was wrong in thinking this way, which is good news for anyone who might have received sacraments from a presider who later turned out to be in mortal sin. In the aftermath of scandal, do you need to get all your sacraments again? Well, no, you don't, and here's why. You see, if the question is whether the validity of a sacrament depends on the holiness of the presider, then the question behind that question is this. Does the grace of a sacrament come to the recipient directly from God, or does it come from God through the presider as some kind of conduit? If grace comes through the presider, then a sinful presider would theoretically not be able to pass on that grace to the recipient. It would be like putting a kink in the hose of grace. The presider in mortal sin would not be able to receive the grace in order to pass it on to the recipient of the sacrament. But thankfully, the answer to that question behind the question is that grace does not come to the recipient through the presider. Sacraments are miracles, not magic tricks, and the grace comes to the recipient directly from God. Another way to say that is that a sacrament is a work of God, not a work of a human person, at least not primarily. And this is why we say that a sacrament works because it is done, not that it depends on factors related to the presider. The Latin phrase for this is ex opere operato. The sacrament works because it is done, that is, as long as it's done correctly. And here's where it gets tricky. Because with Novation's schism, something new had emerged. Before Novation, it could always be assumed that if a person came into the church from a heresy, he or she needed to be baptized. Not rebaptized, but just baptized. If a person came from Judaism, even though they had had their purification baths, well, that wasn't Christian baptism, and so they needed to be baptized. In fact, the church fathers all assumed that even the people who had been baptized by John the Baptizer, those people still needed to be baptized with Jesus' baptism. And obviously, if someone came to Christianity from some Greco-Roman mystery cult, they're not going to say, 
Well, I was baptized in bull's blood in my initiation to Isis, so I don't need to be baptized with Christian baptism. No, you still need to be baptized. And if someone came to Christianity from one of the heresies we've looked at so far, well, they would also need to be baptized. If a Marcionite was baptized in the name of some cosmic phantom Christ, he would still need to be baptized with Christian baptism. In fact, Marcion himself allowed up to three baptisms for each of his followers. But that's not a real Christian baptism. So, if that person were to come into the mainstream, they would have to be baptized. Likewise, if an adoptionist was baptized in some non-Trinitarian baptism, well, that's also not real Christian baptism, so that person would have to be baptized. But Novation was doctrinally orthodox, at least with regard to the doctrine of the Trinity. And that means that his baptism was a legitimate baptism into the right God, into the Trinity. So if someone was baptized by Novation and then joined the Catholic mainstream, did that person need to be baptized? Well, Cyprian of Carthage said yes. He claimed that he had the older tradition. Of course we baptize heretics. But what he missed was that now there was a new situation. Now there was a distinction to be made between heresy and schism. And now it was possible for someone to be in schism and yet not quite be a heretic to the point that it makes them no longer Christian. Now, to be fair, most of the church fathers would have said that all schism is automatically heresy. But the point is that beginning with Novation's schism, that's really no longer the case. It is now possible to be outside the mainstream church and in a faction, but one which is orthodox enough to affect a valid baptism. And in any case, in the end, in rebaptizing Novationists, Cyprian was actually accepting the same errors about baptism as Novation. And this flawed understanding of baptism took hold in North Africa. Now, fast forward a bit, and in time, in North Africa, this same flawed understanding of baptism got extrapolated to the other sacraments. In other words, well, what if your priest was ordained or your bishop was elevated to the episcopacy by someone who lapsed in a persecution? And this is where we come to the controversy over a group known as the Donatists. Now, I know I'm getting a little ahead of the timeline here, but we need to talk about the Donatists now because they had taken this flawed sacramental theology to its logical conclusion until it became a full-blown heresy. In many ways, the Donatists were just another group of rigorists, following in the footsteps of the rigorists we have already met, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Hippolytus, and of course Novation. And while not all rigorists are necessarily heretics, the Donatists took it to the extreme and thereby placed themselves on the fringes of the mainstream church, and in fact, they became separatists. They combined and amplified these two errors. First, that flawed ecclesiology that saw the church as an enclave in which the pure have to be protected from the impure. And second, the flawed sacramental theology in which the holiness of the presider is a criterion of validity. And so they followed Cyprian of Carthage in their belief that all schismatics needed rebaptism, except that the Donatists said that the Catholics were the schismatics. And so they believed that any Catholic who joined them needed to be rebaptized. And, as I mentioned, they applied this same logic to holy orders. So after the next round of persecutions, in the year 311 AD, a new bishop of Carthage was elected 
His name was Kaikelian. But a group of rigorists in North Africa made the accusation that one of the bishops who had consecrated Kaikelian had cooperated with the Romans and had handed over some church property. Now, that probably means that soldiers came to confiscate some liturgical objects and he didn't die defending them. But in any case, there's no proof that it was even true. The point is that these North African rigorists claimed that, therefore, the consecration of Caecilian to bishop was invalid, and he was not a bishop. And, as you might guess, they were ready to elevate their own guy to bishop. So this is really a case of the rigorists trying to challenge an election for bishop and get one of their own to be the next bishop of Carthage. Now, their bishop's name was Donatus, and that's how they come to be called Donatists. They were the followers of Donatus. And since the mainstream church did not depose Caecilian, the Donatists claimed to have their own bishop in Carthage in opposition to Caecilian, and North Africa was in schism. And this would spread to the point where most of the bigger cities in North Africa essentially had two bishops and two separate ecclesial communions, the Catholics and the Donatists. And when St. Augustine became Bishop of Hippo Regis in North Africa, the Catholics in that city were actually the minority. There were more Donatists in Hippo than Catholics. So, this is very much like Novatian's schism, in the sense that the Donatists seem to be doctrinally orthodox with regard to the Trinity, but their heresy is a heresy of ecclesiology and sacramental theology. Now, the Catholic Church and the Donatists existed side by side in North Africa until the Islamic invasion in the 7th century. At that time, North Africa which had been predominantly Christian for 500 years, ceased to be Christian. What's at stake in all this is the question of what baptism really is. As I mentioned, baptism is not primarily a human work, and it certainly is not what some branches of the Protestant Reformation would later make it out to be, that is, a rite of passage that commemorates a prior human decision. Baptism was always understood to be not simply a ritual of initiation, but a work of God that regenerates the recipient. Yes, the early and medieval church always taught baptismal regeneration, but they did not teach a kind of once saved, always saved doctrine of guaranteed perseverance. So, while baptism now saves you, to quote St. Peter, it does not guarantee your perseverance to salvation. In other words, the Church always taught that a person can lose salvation through post-baptismal sin. And this is the issue. If a person commits mortal sin after being baptized, what is the remedy for that? Is it re-baptism? The church says, no, as long as the person was validly baptized, we do not repeat baptism. The remedy for post-baptismal mortal sin is a different sacrament, the sacrament of confession, penance, and reconciliation. The lion's share of the work in clarifying all of this was done by two church fathers. The first was the 3rd century Bishop of Rome, Pope St. Stephen. After St. Cornelius, there was a pope called Lucius, and then after him, Stephen, who was Bishop of Rome from 254 to 257 AD. Stephen of Rome recognized what his colleague Cyprian of Carthage had not. Stephen saw the distinction between a schism that is doctrinally orthodox enough to validly baptize, like Novatian's schism, and one that is not. But Cyprian refused to acknowledge that nuance, so to him, all schism is automatically a heresy without a valid baptism. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that Cyprian of Carthage was a heretic. He was not. 
And both Cyprian and Stephen would agree that baptism is unrepeatable. That is, you cannot repeat a valid baptism. Their disagreement was over what constitutes a valid baptism. And in the dialogue between Stephen and Cyprian, Stephen would eventually clarify that what really matters, what really makes a baptism valid, is that the person is baptized into the right God, the real God, who is the Trinity, and that the baptism is conducted in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Along with the use of water, the naming of the Trinity in this way, and only in this way, is the criterion for a valid baptism. Now, if you're wondering why it must be only this Trinitarian formula, check out my episodes 7 and 8 on modalism and on the positive contributions of novation. So, it's not about who does the baptism. In fact, there are occasions when a layperson can validly baptize, for example, in an emergency. No, it's about into whom is the person baptized. And a valid baptism is one in which the recipient is baptized into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the end, Stephen would say that rebaptism is exactly what schismatics do, and by practicing rebaptism, you make yourself a schismatic. Well, the other church father that greatly contributed to the clarification of all this was, of course, St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo Regis in North Africa. He opposed the Donatists in the early 5th century. He wrote theological treatises against the Donatists, exposing their errors and explaining the correct teachings of the Catholic Church. Augustine corrected the Donatists on, among other things, their ecclesiology, and Augustine had, of course, the correct understanding of the Church and her sacraments. The Church is not an enclave of the pure to be protected from the impure. The Church is a hospital that welcomes everyone, for everyone needs healing, and so that everyone can receive the medicine of the sacraments. And so, what the Church teaches to this day about the sacraments was actually clarified in the aftermath of these controversies and schisms. The conclusion of the Church Fathers is that the sacraments are works of God. They are not works of humans that can be corrupted by sin in the presider. And so, if we were to ask, what are the criteria for a valid baptism, that is, a baptism which cannot be repeated without offending God, who was at work in the baptism? Well, first, the criteria for valid baptism have nothing to do with the holiness of the presider. Now, I know you want your bishop or priest to be holy, but if he's in mortal sin, that does not invalidate the sacraments. They work by the doing of them, ex opere operato. Second, the criteria for valid baptism have nothing to do with the age of the recipient. Infant and child baptism was always done in the church. We can see whole households being baptized already in the New Testament, in Acts 11 and in 1 Corinthians 1. And while it is assumed that a sacrament may lack efficacy if the recipient has no faith or is in opposition to the sacrament, in other words, you can't baptize someone against their will, the Church has always accepted the reality of vicarious faith, that is, the faith of parents or sponsors counts for the infant or child. Also, it is not a requirement that the recipient understand the theology of baptism or even the Christian faith to any certain level, because if it were, then people who are severely mentally challenged could not be baptized. Now, sometimes you will hear people mention Tertullian, who seems to have advised the postponement of baptism, but he did that precisely because it could not be repeated. And so he thought that, for some people, it might be wise to wait, not until they were older, per se, 
but until they were ready to commit to a lifestyle of avoiding mortal sin. In any case, Tertullian is the outlier here, though later it would become more common for people to postpone their baptism. But not because they didn't believe in vicarious faith and infant baptism. It was because they were worried that if they committed mortal sin after their baptism, they might lose their salvation. Third, the criteria for valid baptism have nothing to do with how the water is applied. Total immersion was the ideal, but by no means was it required. Pouring water over the person's head was perfectly valid, and we see this already in the first century in the document known as the Didache. Now, of course, the element of water itself is required, but it wasn't a matter of how it was applied. And before long, it's assumed that no baptism would have been done without the sign of the cross and the anointing with oil, though in the earliest centuries of the church, there was some variety in how or when the oil was applied. But for all intents and purposes, the one criterion that determined whether a baptism is valid is that it must be done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The name of the Trinity, and pronounced only that way, is what matters, because that's what determines what God a person is baptized into. Now, you may not be aware of this, but when a Christian is baptized, he or she is not baptized into the Catholic Church per se, or into any particular ecclesial communion or denomination. A person is baptized into the universal and mystical body of Christ. As both the scriptures and our creed affirm, there is only one baptism. And this is why if you got baptized by the Lutherans, for example, and later you became Catholic, you do not need to be re-baptized, as long as your baptism was in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that is a valid baptism, and it cannot be repeated. Now, the Church does have a concession for when we don't know whether a person was validly baptized, and so we can do provisional baptisms, which is to say, we have a ritual for when only God will know whether it is a baptism, in the case of someone who was not validly baptized, or whether it is simply a remembrance of baptism, in the case of someone who was validly baptized. But if it is known that someone was validly baptized, and that person is rebaptized because of some other factor, that is the heresy of rebaptism. Any baptism done correctly is valid, and any attempt at rebaptism after a valid baptism is a heresy, as well as an act of schism against the body of Christ. In the end, both the Regional Council of Arles in the year 314 AD and the Ecumenical Council of Nicaea in 325 condemned the practice of rebaptism. Here's a quote from Canon 8 of the Council of Arles. If anyone come to the church from a heresy, let them ask him the creed, and if it shall appear certain that he was baptized in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let him receive only the laying on of hands, that he may receive the Holy Spirit. But if, when he is asked, his reply does not contain this trinity, let him be baptized. So, who are the modern Donatists? Well, anyone who rebaptizes those who were already validly baptized. Any Protestant denomination that rebaptizes other Christians, whether because they only recognize adult baptism, or they only recognize full immersion baptism, or because they are separatists and don't recognize any other baptisms. If they do any of that, they are practicing the heresy of the Donatists. Now, to be clear, simply waiting until someone is an adult to be baptized is not in itself a heresy, though I will talk more about this in a later episode in the context of Pelagianism. But to rebaptize is an insult to God 
who was at work in the original baptism. And if blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is defined as ascribing the work of God to some entity other than God, then rebaptism is a kind of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of ironic that while the historic church taught that baptism regenerates, but salvation can be lost, some of the Protestant reformers taught the opposite, that baptism does not regenerate, but salvation cannot be lost. We'll go deeper into that in a future episode, but for now it's important to understand that baptism was always believed to be the beginning of a journey, a journey of sanctification leading to salvation, but with no guarantees. It requires perseverance. And so, as I always say, baptism is a clean slate, but it's not a free ride. That is to say, baptism only washes away original sin and whatever personal sin a person may have committed up until the moment of baptism. But no one before the Protestant Reformation ever taught or believed that baptism could wash away the sins you hadn't committed yet. And so there was no once saved, always saved doctrine. So it's an incorrect theology of baptism to present baptism as simply the public statement of a faith previously accepted. Now, this is not a perfect analogy, but you could think of it this way. Novation's schism was recognized at the Council of Nicaea as legitimately Christian in much the same way that we might now recognize many of the Protestant denominations or Eastern Orthodox communions. They are Christian, but not Catholic. And the practical demonstration of this recognition is that people baptized in those communions or denominations do not get rebaptized if they become Catholic, for example, at the Easter Vigil. The Donatists, however, are significantly farther out from the center of the church, and so they might be analogous to the more separatist fundamentalists who don't recognize our baptism as valid or perhaps the set of Acontists who don't recognize the legitimacy of our Pope and our bishops, especially those who reordain any clergy who join them, or even some of the Eastern Orthodox who would rebaptize Catholics. And so, to make anything other than the name of the Trinity the issue, including disagreements over ecclesiology or sacramental theology, or to make things like the age of the recipient, or the method of applying water, or even the holiness of the presider, criteria for the validity of baptism, to do any of that is to imply that baptism is a human work and not a work of God, and that is to fall into the heresy of the Donatists, the heresy of rebaptism. Next time on The Way of the Fathers, the heresy you've all been waiting for, Arianism. Thanks for listening. De quorum solemnitate Gauden tangeli Et collaudant fili Way of the Fathers is a production of CatholicCulture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings. Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. And the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at CatholicCulture.org.